Boy, everybody seems very quiet today. <laughs> Probably thought he was the only one I saw today who didn't seem like they had the highest of spirits, but as I walked around, a lot of people seemed that way. It just seemed like, oof. We just had Christmas. Um, we, had a, we had a wonderful Christmas Eve service in the evening. I can tell you that much. It was just astonishing how much the Lord blessed us and how many people were here and what a good spirit there was when we were in the house. Um, but boy, I know what you know. After having one thing after the next, you're tired. And everything in you says, I think I'll just stay home on Sunday. And I'm glad that you didn't listen to that because that's not the voice of God. And when I was a boy, we used to call it the Lord's Day for a reason. And it still is the Lord's Day and it will always be the Lord's Day and amen to that. And I thought when I was looking around seeing everybody that maybe I should start a little bit differently than what I originally thought. And don't worry, I won't stay with this style very long because it doesn't fit me very well. Um, I was thinking, how can I sort of help everybody get a little bit better start? I don't do this very often. In fact, I don't remember the last time I did that. So I'm going to tell you a couple of, couple of humorous jokes for just a second. Don't want to see if you can laugh, but don't throw anything. All right? Okay. What kind of man was Boaz before he married Ruth? He was ruthless. Oh, oh, yes. Did you hear about the married couple who were newly married and they started arguing over whose responsibility it was to make the morning coffee? And she said to him, it says right in the Bible whose responsibility it is. And he said, no, it doesn't. She said, yes, it does. He said, where? And she said, Hebrews. Ooh, get the hook, get the hook. How about Adam and Eve? One day when their children were a little bit older, they said, how in the world did we lose our place in the, in the Garden of Eden? It was such a beautiful place. And Adam said to his children, your mother raised us out of house and home. Boo! Boo! How long did Cain not like Abel? As long as he was able. That's even worse. You, I don't think I've ever told you this. But in my family, it's either on a Smith family, or that's half of my mom was a Smith. I always thought, boy, my life would be so much easier if my mother had said to my father, we're not going with Van Thorfer, we're going with Smith. <laughs> but I also had Hitchcock blood. That's the blood that was down here in Ocean City many, many years ago. And I heard that in one of the, either the Hitchcocks or in the, um, in the Smith family, that one of our families was the first one to have a vaudeville theater in New York. And you're probably saying that, helps me understand a lot of different things. I just don't know why Jim doesn't get the hook and take, and take him out of here. Well, I hope that you're, you're willing to laugh a little bit because let me tell you something, laughter is a gift of God. And so is the fact that we have another day. And so is the fact that through the strength of Christ, we don't have to just endure this day, we can still have joy come what may. We've been talking about a very serious subject today. It's been in my heart for a long, long time. And it just seemed as I was praying to the Lord and asking him what to share with you today, he just kept on coming back to me over and over and over again and reinforced the fact that there's some things we need to really pray for. If you read the paper, if you watch the news, you know as well as I do there's a lot of things going on, but sometimes you don't have to go outside your door to recognize there's a lot of things that need prayer. Why is prayer so important? Well, prayer connects us to God. More than anything else we do, Prayer connects us to God. People say to me, how long should I pray? I say, pray until you know you've talked to God and pray until you know God's talked with you. Sometimes that's a long prayer. Sometimes that's a short prayer. But it is always, it is always good to pray. What else does praying do besides connecting us to God? It strengthens us. There's times I'm facing things and I think, wow, I just can't deal with this. But if I pray about it and I pray about it earnestly and I pray about it sincerely, then guess what? All of a sudden I know that I don't have to do it on my own. There's a lot of things I know I can't have on my own, including getting up here. If I didn't know God was with me, I would never step up here. There's no doubt about that, but I'm grateful he is, and that's why I do it. What else does prayer do? It grows us. When we really pray, when we genuinely make that a part of our everyday life, it grows us as a Christian in an astonishing way. What else does prayer do? It comforts us. A lot of times when we're, when we're discouraged and we just talk with God, and we just take a long walk with God and talk with Him and pour out our heart. It does a beautiful thing for us. What else th does prayer do? It equips us. Who doesn't need to be more equipped in the world in which we live? And even in our private worlds too. But that's not where the blessings of prayer stop. It not only equips us, it causes us to be better lights in a darkened world. It is always good to pray. And one of the things that it's best for us to pray, maybe it's best is a was a word that just can, means one. So let me say one of the things, one of the many things that is especially good to pray for is wisdom. 
I'm afraid we've got a lot of knowledge these days, and when I hear what's happening with the computers and the AI and all that stuff, much of which I don't even understand, I'm grateful for a lot of the things they're saying that can happen, but the more I recognize when I look around, the more I see across the world that we need to pray for wisdom. And that's what we'll be talking about today, the need to pray for wisdom. There's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. There's a big difference between insight and wisdom. We need to pray for wisdom. Wisdom is a gift from God, but it's got some qualifiers. We'll be talking about those today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're with us all the time. And Father, we thank you we can laugh about silly things like the goofy jokes that I told. Father, we thank you, Lord, you're with us in serious times, too. You're with us when we're struggling. You're with us when we're not even sure whether we're up or down or inside out. You're with us when the evil one comes up against us. You're with us when our own spirit is fighting against us, our own humanity screaming out, shouting out in so many different ways. Father, we want to pray to love you more. We want to pray to be a, a disciple. We want to pray for a lot of different things. But Father, what you placed in my heart to share today is one that people don't often think about nearly as much as they need to, and that certainly includes me. Lord, may we be given the gift of wisdom. Father, wisdom is a precious gift. Your Bible tells us that in so many ways, so many different times. And yet it's one that's overlooked so often. Father, we pray, Lord, that today you'd help us to shut off the world for a while. We pray, Lord, that we would really just tune in to what you have to say. We pray, Lord, that all the verses that we look at would become alive for us and we'd see what they actually mean. Father, we live in a world where people are even striving to change the Bible. Lord, may we never do that. For Lord, your word is your word, and you've placed the words of the Bible in there for a reason and for a purpose. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to just um, open up the Bible. We pray that we would open up our hearts. We pray we'd invite the Spirit of God to convict us where necessary, lead us where we need to go, and to inform us how we can be more for what you want, want us to be and do. Father, we thank you that you offer us the gift of wisdom. May we be wise enough to take it. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, how do you begin a book on wisdom? Because when you start thinking about wisdom, people think, well, you're just trying to play some sort of a game. Wisdom and knowledge are the really differences between those things. How do you begin something like that? Well, I always pause, pray, and ponder before I ever come up before you and share anything with you. And I was thinking about where to begin, and I thought about a song that was back in 1955. It's been quite a while. Sheldon Harnick, he wrote it, and it was entitled The Merry Minuet. You may remember that a little bit. It was made popular by the Kingston Trio. I remember them, but not particularly for this particular song. Listen to its words. They're riding in Africa, they're starving in Spain, there's hurricanes in Florida, and Texas needs rain. This whole world is festering with unhappy souls. The French hate the Germans, the Germans hate the Poles. Italians hate the Yugoslavs, and the South Africans hate the Dutch, and I don't like anybody very much. But we can be tranquil and thankful and proud, for man has been endowed with a mushroom-shaped cloud. And we can be certain that some lovely day, someone will spark the, set the spark off, and we'll all be blown away. They're riding in Africa, there's strife in Iran. What nature doesn't do to us will be done by our fellow man. 69 years ago, that song was written, almost 70 years ago. But its message still rings true on so many levels. Although there's been so many advances in medicine, I'm grateful for all the advances that have been medicine. I give credit to God, but I'm thankful that he's put in the, the capability of people to be able to help so many different people of things I used to see in the old days. When I was first in the ministry, if you had problems with your hip and you broke your hip, one year later, most of the time, you were not alive because your life, you couldn't do anything. You couldn't do anything. And now I'm with people who get a hip replacement and they're up and walking that same day. I remember being with Stephanie, had two of them replaced on the same day. And I watched her do that and I was astonished. I'm grateful that although I have problems with my eyes, I can still see out of my eyes. And I thank God for that and I thank God that he's given the ability to help people have changes in medicine that have been good. I'm grateful for many of the scientific things that have been become known. And I'm grateful for some of the technology. But what do I know that you know too? There is still so much turmoil in the hearts of so many 
people. Now, I want you to hear this because I just have an overflow, and I don't want you to hear me. I pray you never hear my voice. I pray you always hear what the Lord has to share with you because that's my desire, and I wouldn't even get up here if that wasn't my desire. Someone once said the situation today is this. There's a lot of knowledge, but very little understanding. Makes sense to me. There's a lot of means, but very little meaning. I agree with that. Lots of know-how, but there's very little know-why. There's lots of sight, but there's very little insight. Simply stated, we are living in a world that lacks a quality that we all know. We're living in a world that lacks wisdom. Wisdom goes beyond knowledge, understanding, and discernment. Knowledge refers to the ability to see. Knowledge re refers to the ability to hear and ascertain through experience. Knowledge resides in the intellect. Understanding is something a little different yet. It's insight into the very nature of something. It's a deeper level of knowledge, if you will. The sermon is the ability to distinguish one thing from another by making moral judgments as to which one is best. Wisdom goes deeper than that. You see, wisdom is exercising good judgment based on knowledge, based on understanding, and based on discernment, and we need to pursue a proper course of action, and that is why so much we need to have wisdom. It's the skill of living well. It is the God-given ability to perceive the nature of the world that the Lord has created and live in accordance in his will in this life. In other words, in other words, we need to recognize that wisdom, wisdom is getting into God's lane and striving to stay there, striving to stay in that frequency earnestly throughout the rest of our life. Again, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me as I was thinking about what to share with you, and he said to me, talk about wisdom. Again, knowledge and wisdom are not synonymous. Those terms do not mean the same thing. Knowledge is the accumulation of information, whereas wisdom is the ability to see the knowledge one possesses in a healthy and constructive manner. Knowledge tends to lead from the simple to the complex, but wisdom does something even more special than that. Wisdom takes the complex and it takes it to the, big, the very simple way. Knowledge in the planet in which we're living is growing exponentially. It has been estimated that about up to 1900, human knowledge was doubling every century. Every century, every century, knowledge was, was doubling. By the end of World War II, knowledge was doubling every 25 years. Today, we're told that doubles about 18 months. You have knowledge that's doubling in what people know. And the doubling of knowledge they tell us in the future, especially with some of the technology we hear in the fu future is coming our way very rapidly, will start happening every 12 hours. Every 12 hours within one day, things are going to be doubled and then doubled again. I appreciate the increase of knowledge and its benefits, but who among us isn't aware that although we know knowledge is growing rapidly, Wisdom is becoming increasingly scarce. Isn't that true? There was a man who lived a long time ago. His name was Will Rogers. And listen to what he said. He said, common sense ain't as common as it used to be. I think to myself, boy, isn't that the truth? And what would he say if he were speaking now? Not long ago, I heard a person say, we are drowning in knowledge, but we are starving for wisdom. Makes sense to me. The evidence and the carnage that result from those things are extracting an ever-increasing price in the world in which we live and in our personal worlds as well. That's why God's Word places a premium not just on knowledge, but even more than knowledge, it places a premium on the value of wisdom. I want you to see what Solomon had to say about it. Go with me in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. We're talking about what? We're talking about wisdom. We're not talking about knowledge. We're talking about wisdom. The ability to use knowledge in a beneficial way, in a way to help ourselves, in a way to help others, in a way to help people we don't even know. The value of wisdom. Solomon is writing, he says these words in Proverbs 3, 13 through 18. He says, blessed. Well, what does the word blessed mean? It means highly favored. Highly favored is what? Is the man, is the person who finds wisdom, very important word, finds wisdom. If you write your Bible, I encourage you to underline the word finds and underline the word wisdom. The man who gains understanding or wisdom for she is she or wisdom is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. 
She is more precious than wisdom, than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all, not just some, all of her paths are peace. She, wisdom, is the tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. Now let's talk about what we just finished reading. Who's writing these words? It's Solomon. What do we know about him from the Bible? We know that according to the scripture, other than Jesus, Solomon was the wisest person who ever lived. And what did Solomon have to say about wisdom in this particular passage? He said, wisdom is more valuable than silver. Wisdom is more valuable than gold. Wisdom is more valuable than jewels. He tells us when we read these words that there's nothing tangible on this earth that can even be compared to the value of wisdom. And why is that? Because he tells us that wisdom yields some things we all desire, and we not just desire things we need. Wisdom yields pleasantness. Wisdom yields peace. Wisdom yields honor. And wisdom, make no mistake about it, yields honors. That's why it's so important to recognize what Solomon says. What did he say? He said, blessed is the one who what? Blessed is the one who finds wisdom. Finds wisdom. Now, what do those words tell us? Blessed is the one who finds wisdom. That tells us not everybody does. Not everybody finds wisdom. And not everybody wants to find wisdom. A lot of people don't even want to make that their goal. What a tragic and pathetic way to live. Let me give you some good news as we head into the new year. Wisdom is available when the Bible says the same. I'm so glad that's true because, believe me, no one has to tell me that life is filled with challenges. Again, I appreciate the value and the benefits of knowledge, but far more than knowledge, one of the things I pray about all through the day, but especially when I'm taking my prayer walks, is the is the desire to want wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. Every day I pray, Lord, looks like a good day to me for you to come back today. Every day I pray, Lord, I so thank you for salvation and all the gifts you've given me. Every day I pray, Lord, help me to love people more than my own human desire would be. And Lord, help me not just to learn a bunch of stuff, but help me to be wise. Wise because I'm so following you. Far more important than knowledge is wisdom. We need to pray for wisdom, real wisdom, lasting wisdom. Again, when I'm talking about wisdom, I'm not talking about, oh, the ability to make change without looking at the cash register. You know, you get a little older and you think, oh, I can remember when people can make change without looking at the cash register. That's not what we're talking about. That's knowledge. It's not talking about they couldn't even read their watch if it wasn't digital. If we're a little older, we think that's a little ridiculous that people can't even read their watch if it's not digital. That's not wisdom either. That's knowledge. I'm not talking about humanly manufactured pithy proverbs such as eat your dessert first. Makes sense to me, but that's not what we're talking about. Or never wrestle with a pig because you'll get dirty and the pig will get dirty, but the pig will enjoy it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the statement that out of the mouth of babes come things that parents wish they never said. I want to go deeper than that because the Lord has put in my heart to talk about the value and the necessity of living a wise life. What are we talking about today? We're not talking about knowledge. We're not talking about discernment. We're not talking about understanding. We're talking about a precious gift of God, the gift of wisdom. One of the people I really, really look up to and who goes strong and continues to go and continues to grow, even though he's in his 90s, is Pastor Charles Swindoll. I've seen his church over in Texas. It just took my breath away to be walking around there and see all the things that they do and all the things that he's done. And he gave a definition of wisdom I think we do well to look at. Gail's gonna put it up on the board. Here's how he describes it. Charles Swindoll, when defining wisdom, said, it's the God-given ability to see life with rare objectivity, rare objectivity, and handle life with what? With rare stability, rare. Why? Because a lot of people don't want to. A lot of people don't even think about it. But that's good, isn't it? What are we talking about? We're talking about wisdom. It's the God-given ability to see life from whose perspective? From my perspective, from your perspective, from our perspective? No, to see life from God's perspective. And, 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 respond, 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 in a Christ 
unerring way, it's not enough to know who to be and what to do. We need to take those things we know. We need to take those things which God has told us. We need to take those things which God has taught us in this word and put them into action. A man who lived a long time ago and was a pastor, he's one of my heroes. He's very humorous and yet he's very pointed. His name was Pastor Vance Havner. I would have loved to have heard him preaching in, in actual life. And he said some words I want you to see as well. Dale's going to put these up on the board. You've heard these words before when we've talked about the mysteries of life. I love these words. I think that they're filled with wisdom from God. He says these things, and I quote him, Some things are for us to know. Some things are not for us to know. We don't even like to read that first sentence, do we? Blessed is the man or the person who learns early on which is which. Now, he was a pastor even longer than me. Look what he says next. Most. Most of our unhappiness is caused by not knowing what we should know and by trying to know what we are not to know. That's so important. There's so much truth in there. If we took those words to heart, our lives would be so much better. I want you to hear his words again. He said, some things are for us to know, some things are not for us to know. Blessed, what does the word blessed mean? It means highly favored, is the person or the man who learns early which is which. Then what does he say? He's been a pastor over 50 years when he writes these words. And he says, most of the unhappiness is caused by not knowing what we should know and by trying to know what we are not to know. Do I hear an amen? Because I ought to. There's a truth in that that we do well to recognize. And when we read these words and recognize the wisdom that's captured in it, we're beginning to recognize that we have wisdom maybe more than what we think. I like those words. They speak to my heart. And I'll tell you why. Because believe me, nobody has to tell me I don't know everything that I wish I needed to know. And I far often than not try to figure out things that are way beyond my understanding. And if I'm not careful, those things can take me down and take me down for a lifetime. Believe me, I've been in that battle more than one time and at times it was pretty deep. But I kept on just leaning on God more than leaning on myself. So let me ask you a question. Can you identify with that? Is it hard for you to know what you need to know, and not try to figure out what you can't understand. Do you get sometimes mixed up on which is which? I think it's difficult for all of us. Have you observed, think about what we just finished reading, have you observed that much of our, yours and mine, unhappiness stems by not knowing what we should know or trying to seek after those things that are not understandable for us, you and me, on this side of heaven? On my own, I have and could continue to hurt if I wanted to. I could waste my life on that quest, and believe me, I've been tempted to do it from time to time. I've seen, because of the work that I do, I've seen it happen with so many different people, and one thing I do know, and I know it for sure, and I know it for certain, is that no one is exempt from that challenge. No one's exempt from that challenge. And with love in my heart, please know this, no one is exempt from that challenge. That means you. That means me. That means us. No, those words aren't easy to hear. I know that. And they're not easy to say either. But let me tell you something. They're an expression of biblical truth. They're an expression of godly wisdom. So do I pray for knowledge? Yes, I do. But even more, I ask the Lord to help me have the gift of wisdom. Because I'm reminded of some verses that are really important. I want you to see a verse that's really important. Go with me to the book of James, chapter 1. James, chapter 1. James was Jesus' half-brother. James didn't even believe in Jesus for a long time, that he was the Christ. But when he saw the resurrected Christ, what's he going to do? He came to the Lord, and he came to the Lord fully. He prayed so often they called him old calumnies. When he was pitching, when he was sharing, he shared nothing but hard balls. And listen to what he has to say in James chapter 1, verse 5. He says, if any of you, there's no exceptions to what he's about to talk, talk about. If any of you what? If any of you lacks wisdom, and we all do, right? We all do. He or she should ask of God who gives generously to all. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, you know he gives generously for those who ask and seek wisdom for the purpose of living it out. But let's continue with the verse. Without finding fault, and it will be given to him or her. He should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. 
it will be given her. Now most of us are familiar with this verse. We know that God makes wisdom available and he's very, and we should be very grateful that he does. But when we do that, a lot of times Satan will say, well, if you're asking for that, you're asking for trouble. No, what does the Bible say right here? It says that he will answer that prayer without reproach and he won't even find fault. Practically speaking, what does that mean? What does wisdom look like? And as I prayed and I thought about that, I kept on thinking about a passage of scripture that fits very closely to what we've been looking about in the last few weeks. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Let's look at that passage together and let's see if we can understand what the scriptures have to say about what wisdom from God looks like. Because sometimes in our world, we say somebody's a wise guy, we're not saying anything good about him, we're saying something bad about him. Matthew chapter 12, verses 1, excuse me, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi, what's that word mean? It means wise men. From the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who's been born the king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come. I've underlined those words in my Bible. I'm a little excited today. I'm going to have to slow down my speech just a little bit. And have come. What did they do? They took action. And what purpose did they have when they took action? Look how the verse continues. To worship him. Where did they come? Just to look at him? Just to peek at him? Just to see him? Just to tell other people they were there? No, they came to worship him. Look how the verses continue. When King Herod heard about all this, he was disturbed, he was irritated, he was troubled. And all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least of the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Well, what happened next? Look how the verses continue. Then Herod called the Magi, or the wise men, secretly, secretly, he called them secretly, another important word, and found out from them the exact time. Believe me, he felt threatened. He called them in secret, and he wanted to find out exactly when they saw the star that it appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful or a thorough search for the child. As soon as you find him, what's he saying when he's saying those words? You better keep on looking until you find him, because you're going to have to find him before you come back and talk with me. As soon as you find him, report to me so I too may go and worship him. After that, they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child, another important word, the child, Jesus was no longer a baby at this time, he was a child. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed, they were overjoyed, they were thrilled. On coming to the house, they saw the child, really important to recognize Jesus was a child then, with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, talk about reverence, and what else did they do? They did just exactly what they said they were going to do. They came to worship him. Then what happened? Then they opened their treasures and presented with him gifts of gold and incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to a country by another route. They were wise in their decisions. Do you see that? They were wise in their responses. Do you see that? Why were they wise? Because God told them what to do, and how did they respond to what God told them to do? They did the things that God told them to do. Where did they go? They went to Bethlehem a small city about five to six miles south of Jerusalem. Bethlehem, a very important place in the Bible, even though it's a small place. Bethlehem was the place where Jacob buried Rachel. Ruth met and married Boaz in Bethlehem. David grew up in Bethlehem and tended sheep in Bethlehem. That's why when you hear people speak about Bethlehem when they are on the radio or on TV, they often refer to it as the city of David. But what made Bethlehem particularly significant are the words of the prophet Micah when he said in Micah 5.2 that the promised Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Now Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 picks up this account saying, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea during the time of King Herod, magi or wise men from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who's been born the king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come. Not to peek at him, not just to stare at him, not just to wave at him. What was the reason that they came? They came to worship him. Now when you're studying the Bible, like anything else you're studying, you need to ask the who, the what, and the why. Well, what's the who? Who were these wise men? What's the where? Where did they come from? Where did they go? And what's the what? 
What's the what that made them wise? Other than this very brief appearance in Matthew chapter 2, we don't hear anything more about these people in the New Testament at all. There's been a lot of speculation, but a lot of the speculation that's been made about these wise men not found in the Bible at all. That's why it's so important we know the Bible. That's why when we finish having little things that we go on for a few weeks, we go verse to verse and book by book because we want everybody to know what the Bible actually says. What have some people said about these wise men? They said that artists have made them riding on camels. But if you know anything about that part of the country, you know that they didn't probably come on camels. What did they usually come on? They came on Arabian stallions. The Christmas carol that most of us grew up hearing was We Three Kings of Orient Are, but the scripture doesn't tell us that there were only three of them. It doesn't tell us that they were kings. It doesn't say anything about them being from the Orient either. The word magi, or wise men, is translated, lets us know these men were descendants of an ancient tribe of people known as the Medes, who were part of the Persian Empire, which is interesting because this place plays a big, big factor in the end of days, speaking about Iran. Let's stop for just a moment. Are we hearing a little bit more about Iran today? Are we recognizing what the Bible has to say about the last days in Iran? Hey, I'm going to take that on and another time, but I wanted to mention. These men were scholars of their time. They were known as the people who came up with the law of the Medes and the Persians. Their laws are referred to in the Old Testament, in the book of Esther, also in the book of Daniel. What do we know for sure about these men? We know they were learned men. If we met them, we would have recognized that they were scientists, mathematicians, philosophers, physicians, as well as legal authorities. The Bible tells us that they had another responsibility that was a mighty one. They were advisors to their leaders and they interpreted dreams. But one of the more important things that they did, one of the more important responsibilities that they had is to select kings. Do you see why the king was troubled when he heard another king had come? No wonder Matthew chapter 2, verse 3 tells us when King Herod heard this, he, and when they arrived in the city, he was disturbed, he was troubled, he was shaken, he was agitated, and all of Jerusalem with him. Clearly the people were fearing how this wicked king would respond. Now that we've established some background, think with me, what made these men worthy of being called wise men? Because today if we say he's a wise guy, we're not saying he's smart. We're not saying something special about him at all. What made these men worthy of being called wise men in the scripture? And practically speaking, what does wisdom from God look like? Because guess what? You don't have wisdom if you don't have it from God. Well, history tells us some things for sure. History tells us there were a lot more wise men than the people who came that night. Certainly something as bright as a new star was not hidden. So where were all the other wise men? Why did so many of these wise men, quote unquote, miss it? Why didn't these guys who didn't come, why didn't they come? Well, we don't know all the reasons for this, but I'll tell you what. As I was pausing, praying, and pondering this, the Lord put some things in my heart that I think fit, and I think we do well to ponder ourselves. Why weren't the others there? Well, I'll answer that question for you. Because they simply failed to look up. You hear that again? Because you don't hear that when you watch TV. You don't hear that when politicians speak. You don't read that in the paper. You don't see that in common communication when you're getting the gas in your car or when you walked into the Wawa or you're walking around some store someplace. What was the reason these others weren't coming? Because they simply failed to look up. The things that were happening all around them grabbed so much of their attention, they failed to look up. Who doesn't at times struggle with that? Sadly, tragically, we are living in a world where more often than not, where do people look? Do they look up? No. They look down. They look left. They look right. Then what do they do after that? Do they look up? Nope. They look down. They look left. They look right. Then they look back down again. Before they make the choice, and hear my heart very clearly, it is a choice, a choice that no one can make for you but for yourself. Make the choice to do what? Make the choice to look up, even if they do so then. What do these wise men in the Bible teach us about the wisdom that comes from God? I see an awful lot of things, but the first thing that I see in this particular story that the Lord has put in my heart to share with you is this. They made the choice to look up. 
What are you saying, Pastor Ron, when you're saying they made the choice to look up? They recognize that God and God alone is the only one who is the source of genuine wisdom. I love what Billy Graham had to say about this. Billy Graham said some words. We're going to put them up on the board. He said, knowledge is horizontal. Jim speaks this a lot. Wisdom is vertical. It comes down from above. Amen to that. Wisdom is from who? Wisdom is from God. Is wisdom from other people? No. Wisdom is from God. These wise men were, knowledge, were wise because the source of their knowledge was not limited to what people knew. They focused on the information that God had provided. They chose to make this journey because they were familiar with the prophecies concerning the promised Messiah in the word of God. The Old Testament tells us that the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar appointed Daniel to be the master of the Magi. If you know anything about Daniel, you know that he took this message which God gave him to heart. That's a wise choice. That's a wisdom qualifier. If we want to be if we want to be wise, I mean we truly want to be wise, we have to make the choice to discipline ourselves to do what? To look up. Not just look down. Not just look left. Uh, let's look right. Not just to look behind us, but we make the choice to look up. Well, what does that mean, Pastor Ron, to look up? Well, it means a lot of different things, but one of the things it means is spending time in God's Word every single day. I've been hoping and challenging people to do that for as long as I can remember, and I can promise you I do that the first part of every morning and throughout the day to open up God's Word and try to study God's Word. Let me ask you a question. In the rush of all the things that are happening in the world and in your world, are you getting caught up with that? Or are you spending time in God's Word? And if you're spending time in God's Word, let me encourage you to go deep rather than wide. Let me encourage you to take gulps of Scripture rather than mere sips of Christian. I want to encourage you when you read the Word of God to ask the Lord to teach you what it means and then make decisions that are led by prayer as you make the decision. And then at the end of the night, you know what I do before I close my eyes? I go through in prayer to the Lord, sharing with him the decisions I made, the choices I made, and asking him if they were wise choices or not, or what more I need to do or learn. This year, I want to challenge you as much as ever to read and study the Word of God in the coming year. Now, I know some people don't like to read. I know that. My eyes get a little bit worse. It's a little harder for me to read. I have to use size 28 print to be able to see well, and sometimes I can't see that. And sometimes I have to play the trombone a little bit when I'm reading these days. So you know what? We're not stuck in the woods with that. We can listen to the Bible on a CD. We can listen to the Bible on the computer. This is how we look up. These are the first steps that we need to take if we genuine desire wisdom. But it doesn't stop there. What does, our what does our passage tell us? It tells us what happened when the men arrived. Mary and Joseph are no longer in the stable or the cave-like structure. Where are they at this particular time? They're in a house. Jesus was no longer an infant or a baby at this time. What was Jesus at this time? He was a child. Historians believe that he was about one to two years old. And that leads us to another trait that shows what wisdom comes from God and what it looks like. Do you see what I do in these passages? These men didn't just collect a lot of information. They acted on the information they received. God sent them a message from heaven, and they were wise enough to do something so important, so vital, something that no one can make you do but yourself, to take the message that God has sent to you very seriously. Information is helpful, but information for information's sake is not that helpful. What is the reason that we want, God wants us to spend time in the Word? What is the reason that God wants us to be wise? So we'll be experiencing transformation through the power of Christ. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, they called him the Prince of Preachers. I'd have loved to watch him preach. There's no doubt about that. He had some words I want you to see as well. We're going to put those up on the board. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, Wisdom is the right use of knowledge. To know is not to be wise. Amen. Many men or people know a great deal, and they are all the greater fools for it. Amen, amen. There is, those are my words, there is no fool so great as the knowing fool. Amen, 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 amen. But to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. That's not only profound, it's so on the mark. 
it's so foolish to amass a lot of information and knowledge, even about the Bible, and not act on it. Why? Why? What did David say was his reason for hiding God's word in his heart? He said, I hide God's word in my heart. For what purpose? So I will not sin against God. Listen to our Lord's half-brother again in James chapter 1, verse 22. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. You see, the objective isn't to get in the Bible trivia and win. It's to be conformed in the image of Jesus, which requires not only taking information in, but being transformed by the wisdom that comes from God as we make a choice that no one can make for us or, but for ourselves to live out the truth he has shown us. There's a third mark of wisdom I see in this passage. These men, they not only saw the star when it was in the east, but they continued to travel in that same direction, even though at times it wasn't visible. Boy, when we don't understand something, boy, we make it bigger and bigger and bigger. Boy, do we get more and more frightened. Boy, do we get more and more shut down. What did these guys do? Did they turn around and go home? No. They kept on traveling in the same direction God told them, even though the star at times wasn't visible. What does that mean? It means they persevered. What does that mean? It means they pressed on. What does that mean? It means they kept on going. They were still growing. Not only when the star was shining, but also in the dark times as well. Hear my heart. I know it not just from being with people for almost 50 years, but I know it from being alive for almost 70 years. There are moments when everything seems clear, but there are also times we are called to walk in the darkness. I don't like that any more than you, but I know it's true. And in those moments, what do we have to do? We have to make a decision that no one can make for us but ourselves. We have to make a decision to walk by faith, not faith in faith. That means nothing. We need to walk in faith knowing and trusting that the Lord is stronger than anything or anyone we will ever face, and He will not abandon us no matter how difficult the path. And I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking maybe I should stop right here because I could talk for a long time. Ask Stephanie, she hears all the extra on the way home. I don't know if that happens with you, Amy, or not. I hope it doesn't. <laughs> it does. Okay. I can't see that well, but I think you shook your head. Okay. That's a good thing. All right? And that doesn't surprise me that the Lord put a little bit more in my heart, and I'll tell you why. Because when I really tap into God, He tells me more. And when I just want to say, well, I read my Bible today, He tells me less. I get that. I get that a lot. These wide may wise men made the trip, not because they wanted to just get something from Jesus. They made the trip because they wanted to give something to Jesus. What a difference. What did they bring him? They brought him very valuable gifts. They brought him the gift of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Think with me about those gifts, because we don't really talk about those over here in this country very much, but they're important things. We have the opportunity to bring the gift of gold, too, and I'll tell you how we get it. It's when we're tested by the fires of trials and we remain Faithful. Sometimes we're tested by fire, but we remain faithful. And when I think about that, I think about what Job said when he was talking about this kind of gold. And he spoke in, Genesis, in Job chapter 23, verse 20. He said, my God knows the way I take, and he has tested me. I will come forth as gold. I have to say to myself sometimes when I want to shut down, when I, want to, when I just want to just say, I've done enough, or long enough, or whatever else. No, 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 no. When I want to stop is when I need to start more than ever before. When I will look back and say, I did this, that, and the other thing is when I need to look forward and say, I still have the opportunity to do a whole lot more and be a whole lot more. Keep on going. Go like forth, like gold. We have the gift to give them frankincense through a life of service. A life of service. I love what the prophet Isaiah had to say about that in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. When he heard the voice in the temple say, Who will go and whom shall we send? Isaiah said, Here I am. Send me. We can give him the gift of myrrh. That's the gift of sacrifice. But the old life has died and we've been raised to walk in newness of life. This is the kind of sacrifice that Paul was speaking of in essence in Philippians when he writes these words in, verses, in chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. He said, I, Whatever... 
whatever gain I have counted for loss for Christ's sake, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. When you least need to step up is when you most need to step up. When you least want to step out is when you most need to step out. If you want to have a life and have all the pro that Christ promises, you need to go forward even when it's hard and you don't understand and when you don't even want to try or understand. What do we see in Matthew chapter 2, verse 12? We read that having been warned in the dream not to go back to Herod, what did these wise men do? They returned to their country by a different route. Now those last words can have a double meaning. One can say that they went home a different direction, but the other can say they went home a different people. A different people. As we close, let me ask you a question I've been thinking about all week long. What can we learn from these wise men? What does wisdom look like? Well, first, the wise men made the choice to look up, recognizing something essential, that God and God alone is the only source of genuine wisdom. If we really believe that, we have to be in the Word and live the Word, pray, and live a life that's led by prayer. I encourage you to pray for that. I encourage you to pray for that for sure. That's a prayer that I have. What else have we seen in this passage? These men didn't just come to collect a lot of information. They acted on the information they had received. It's not enough just to take information in. What do we have to do with the information God has given us? We have to make the, we have to make the choice to live it out. Not just read his word, but live it out. And ask him to help us to put it in practice. What does that mean? We ask him very specifically to speak like Jesus, think like Jesus, act like Jesus. We ask him what's our spiritual gift and then encourage other people and bless other people in his name by using our spiritual gift. What else did we see in this particular passage? The wise men chose to persevere not only when the sun was shining but also in the dark times come as well. And if we really want to be wise, that's what we have to do too. We have to pray for that. Don't ever forget, these wise men came to Jesus not just to get something from him but to give something to him. And we can do that too when we're tested by fire, when we give him a life of service and we give him a life of sacrifice. That's so, so important. And what happened to these wise men at the end? They went home a different path than what they went. They went home a different way. And not only was the path different, they were different. They were different. Interestingly, these three men, who we don't even know their name, we don't know hardly anything about them at all, we're still talking about them 2,000 years later. And we can still learn from them, even though probably none of us have been on an Arabian stallion in our life or followed a star in the middle of the night. Today's New Year's Eve. What kind of New Year do you really want to have? kind of new life do you really want to have? Here's my prayer for me. It's my prayer for you. It's a prayer for Heavenward Christian family, family of faith. Let's make this next year special. Let's make this next year really count. Let's put into practice the lessons we've learned in this passage. Let's pray for wisdom. But we can't stop there. Let's live it out. Let's live it out. Let's pray for wisdom and live it out. God will help us. So will other members of the family of faith. But we have to have that desire. And we have to make that choice. And God himself will not thrust that on us. But when we reach for that goal and we make that our goal, our lives are changed, and we shine in a way that people know God is real. And not just other people know it. Guess what else? You know it in ways you never dreamed you ever would. So today I gave you a pep talk, more so than a sermon. I'm not sure what it was. I spoke fast, I know. My heart's flying. My heart's pumping. That's why I'm wearing a vest today. I don't want to scare anybody. But you know what? Regardless of your eschatology, the study of the last times, things are getting different in intensity and number. Scripture says it's coming. 
Learn what's coming. Learn how to respond. Be a light. He's giving you life for a reason. Give your life back to him. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, I feel like we're in the locker room of a stadium. And it's halftime. And Lord, I am certainly, certainly not Newt Rockman. But Father, we, we live in a world that has troubles and strains and pains. We live in a world that's tinged and stained with all kinds of despair, hopelessness, anger, frustration, deceit. Father, we don't want those things to be true in our world. But Father, we can say that all we want to. And we can talk about we did this and we did that for years and years and years, but it's what we're doing now that makes a difference. You tell us in the Word where people said, we did this and we did that. And you said, yes, you did, but now you don't have a name anymore. You had a name. You don't continue to have it. Lord, may we have a name, not just as individuals, but as a fellowship that takes the Word of God seriously. We take it in, we live it out. We encourage each other, even when it's hard. Father, I thank you, Lord, that there is no one like you. And I thank you, Lord, that you put this scripture in the Bible because there's so many things we can learn that will help us be wise. Lord, in a world that praises knowledge, may we value wisdom. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.